Thank you very much. Uh, I let me first express my appreciation uh, to the college, your president, and sister and Scott for the invitation to come here. Uh, as I talk to people, I was reminded of the fact that this is my third visit here for various reasons. I came and spoke uh, on campus at one time, spoke to the sisters at another, and so this is the third time that uh, I'm able to come and I'm grateful to do it. Uh, as you, some of you may know, I was scheduled to come earlier and we had an emergency in the diocese and I literally had to call the day before I couldn't come and everyone was extraordinarily gracious to me at that time. So I'm grateful to be able to fulfill the promise that I would come and give this lecture on the social teaching of Benedict XVI. Uh, my purpose is to locate Benedict in a larger framework of the social teaching of the church and at the same time to seek to illustrate his distinctive contribution to that teaching. And so I'm going to proceed in three steps. I want to begin more broadly with the subtopic of Benedict and the world, minor kind of description, but I'll try and keep it contained. Uh, secondly, I then want to look at Catholic social teaching, which is the focus of our concern in a, both a short historical and analytical view of that teaching. And then thirdly, turn to John Paul II and Benedict together. And I'll explain when I get there why I am treating the two of them together. So first, let me begin with Benedict and the world. Now, why would I give that title and why don't I just dive into the encyclical that uh, is the focus of our concern? <coughs> well, I think in all honesty, the pontificate of Benedict XVI has its own distinctive style, purpose, and accomplishments, but it lives, in a sense, in the shadow of John Paul II. Um, and the fact that Benedict was the, uh, was the cardinal prefect of the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith under John Paul II for so many years, but more uh, to the point, uh, of all the figures of the 20th century, whether secular or sacred, that made an impact on the history of that century, John Paul II makes any short list. And so to come next in the papacy is to some degree to have the shadow of John Paul II in the background. So then the question almost inevitably for Benedict XVI from beginning to the end was how he would fit on this question of the stage of world history, if you will. No one had any doubt about how he would fit in terms of being a theologian of enormous renown. But the question of how he would play on the stage of history was another issue. On the one hand, you had this extraordinary figure of John Paul II, Pope for 26 years, uh, a man who, in a sense, personified the 20th century having lived through the three wars of that century, World War I, World War II, and then the Cold War. A person who was credited in part with ending the Cold War, this momentous, rather, encounter of two empires at war across the world. So you have that in the background, and then you come to Benedict XVI. So what does he bring to the papacy? Well, a scholar, a scholar of major proportion. Uh, Father Richard McBrien of Notre Dame does not always agree with Benedict XVI. If you read his columns, you will know that. But he has said of Benedict XVI that without a doubt, he is the most significant theologian ever to sit in the chair of Peter. So no one doubted his accomplishments. Uh, secondly, he was a scholar, however, of the internal life of the church. Uh, his field was not social ethics, as John Paul's had been. Uh, his interests were not, if you will, church world interests. But the internal life of Catholicism was his major uh, focus. Thirdly, he had some pastoral experience. Uh, he was archbishop of a major diocese in Germany. But again, a different kind of pastoral experience than his predecessor, who stood at the intersection of the struggle of communism and Catholicism. I mean, in, in Poland, 
from the end of World War II on, even before World War II, the struggle was always who represented the Polish people, who most adequately represented them, the communist state or the Catholic Church. And so this pope, John Paul II, had lived at the intersection of that rather titanic struggle. Benedict, therefore, came without question with assets, but he also came with gaps in terms of this question, the church and the world question. So what has happened so far since 2005, his encounter with the world? What has that been like? Well, three major uh, examples, if you will, uh, point out how he has walked onto this stage. First, his address to the United Nations in 2008. Secondly, his engagement with Islam. And thirdly, his engagement with uh, the representative democracies of the world, particularly Europe and the United States. Just a word on each of them, because this is the broad background picture. The UN address, these addresses of the, U, uh, of the popes before the UN are of fairly recent vintage in terms of the history of the papacy, but they have become sort of set pieces uh, and very significant pieces where the new pope is invited, usually within the first few months of his being elected, to address the United Nations. No other religious figure is invited to address the General Assembly of the, of the United Nations. Now, that, that has something to do with the fact that the Vatican, as a diplomatic presence, is, uh, is an observer at the UN. But these, uh, these addresses have taken on a, a signature significance. Uh, Paul VI was the first pope to do it. It doesn't go back that very far. He addressed the UN in 1965. James Reston, the New York columnist of great fame during that time, said no voice had lifted the spirit of Washington as this voice had at the UN, a really interesting comment. John Paul II addressed the United Nations two times, and then Benedict came to address it in 2008. Now what was interesting about Benedict's address in 2008 was that this man who was known primarily as a theorist and a theologian and not someone who in a sense had been closely engaged with what you might call the concrete details of politics. What was interesting about the UN speech was he dove right in to some of the most controversial topics of the day in the forum of the UN. First of all, there was the question of religion and politics. Uh, he has made it a point, and I will come back to this, again and again, to stress, if you will, uh, the, the, the need for the church to be what he calls a public church. A, uh, he says that the meaning of Catholic social teaching in, the, in its origin, he is the first person I've ever heard describe it this way, he said the origin of Catholic social teaching was that the church wanted to establish its citizenship in the political arena, the public arena of nations. And so he dove into that question. Secondly, he took up the question of human rights, a pervasive issue at the UN. Now this was a topic that John Paul II had addressed at length in his first speech to the UN in 1979. But Benedict took up the topic in a rather controversial way. Uh, among the scholars uh, who deal with human rights and world politics, there is a debate about whether it, it is necessary to ground human rights in what you might call a theoretical foundation, a philosophical foundation, or whether you can treat human rights as more political concepts say people will never agree on what the foundations are, so let's just take them at the surface and try to make the best we can out of human rights concepts. One of my colleagues at Kennedy School, an extraordinarily important figure in, uh, in scholarship on human rights, who is now a political figure, he is the leader of the Liberal Party in Canada, Michael Ignatieff. Ignatieff's view is you cannot get agreement on the foundations of human rights. 
and therefore you ought to stick at the surface level and treat them as concepts that whatever people's grounding of them is, they can come to agree on certain ideas like freedom of conscience, freedom from torture, etc. Benedict drove, dove right into the middle of this debate and argued that in his view, unless human rights had a strong philosophical foundation, they would always be vulnerable. Vulnerable to someone basically, I suppose, saying they were created out of thin air. Now this question had been around for a long time. As a matter of fact, uh, in the drafting of the UN Declaration on Human Rights, one of the drafters of that document was Jacques Maritain, a uh, famous Catholic philosopher. I'm sure he is read here at this Dominican institution. And Jacques Maritain was working on the UN Declaration of Human Rights and a reporter asked him, he said, uh, well, you know, how's it going on preparing the document on human rights? And Maritain said, we all agree on human rights as long as no one asks us why we agree on it. So there is a way in which this story is a long story. Benedict drove right into the middle of the debate and laid out a position in the debate that is not a majority position, I think. Thirdly, perhaps even more controversially, at the end of his speech to the UN, he took up a topic that is so current this minute that I won't have to remind you of its significance. It is the doctrine called the responsibility to protect. It grew out of debates in the 1990s where we had this series of internal conflicts in states, Bosnia, Rwanda, Somalia, Kosovo. We had these, these, these internal conflicts and debates about what the world ought to do about them. Now, if that sounds like Libya and the seven o'clock news, you're right. We are still trying to figure out when there is an internal conflict in a state, does anyone else have the duty to do anything or even the right to do anything because the international system is based on what is called sovereignty, sovereign states, and it has been taken for centuries that the essence of sovereignty is the right of a state to control things within its own boundaries. Now, once you adopt the UN Declaration on Human Rights, that challenges this kind of absolute character of sovereignty. So, Benedict, by the end of the 1990s, uh, after having had case after case where we fumbled and we weren't sure uh, what to do, both politically, morally, and strategically, uh, there grew up, under the guidance again of a Canadian initiative, uh, there grew up a body of thought called the responsibility to protect. Uh, and the idea is that this affirms that the meaning of sovereignty in the first instance is a state owes its own citizen protection of their human rights. And if the state does not do that, the argument behind responsibility to protect is the responsibility to protect the citizens of that country devolves to the wider international community. So it's a very far-reaching proposal because it redefines sovereignty, a concept that has been at the heart of world politics since the 17th century. Benedict just in one sentence endorsed the idea. Now that will cause gulps in international law faculties uh, across the country and, and in many other places besides. So he stepped into religion and politics, human rights, and responsibility to protect in one speech before the UN. So this retiring theologian all of a sudden was in a cauldron of debate uh, about his meaning. Second part of the cauldron, of course, was his address to Islam. This is a little more rocky. You will remember uh, that early in his pontificate, he went back to Germany uh, to give an address at a university where he had taught, Regensburg. And at, at Regensburg, he again gave a very sort of far-reaching address. I mean, it, it is his style as a systematic theologian not to get too tied up in narrow questions. So he steps into the platform at Regensburg to address 
uh, essentially, again, the question of religion and politics. But in fact, the speech was more specific than that. It really, uh, cl clearly, under the cover of religion and politics, he was addressing Islam. So what happened on that front? Well, the speech itself, you may remember, was very controversial. Uh, the response to it from the Islamic community was there were burning of Catholic buildings and killing of Catholic missionaries. Uh, I think the controversial part of it came from a clear tactical mistake, and this might have shown his inexperience to some degree on the public platform, because he tried to pay tribute to a scholar on the faculty at Regensburg who was sitting in front of him and who had written this book on Islam and who had quoted a 13th century author that said basically nothing good has ever come from Islam. And, and so the why we had to pick out that quote, I'm just not sure. But in any case, if you stand back and look, at, I gave a homily the following Sunday, and I began by saying, why do you think the Pope said that? And then everyone just, but it was, it was a, uh, a, 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 a deeper speech, though. It, when you got over the controversy, what was clear was that he went to this platform, and again, under the theme I'm trying to develop of how he addresses the world, the question of Catholicism's relationship with Islam is a dominant question in the world. We are the two fastest growing religions in Africa. We, of course, encounter each other in the Middle East, but also in Southeast Asia. And in past history, it has not always been a gentle uh, relationship. So the question about how we conduct that relationship today is of major importance. And, but if you look at what he tried to do in the speech, the speech had two different audiences. Uh, and this is where it was difficult that, it, that that quote dominated everything, because this was a very serious double proposal. His first audience was the Western academic world, not just Regensburg, but across Europe and certainly across the United States. And to that audience, he made an argument that said that if we try to construct our view of the world, our view of human nature, our view of meaning in life, totally on the basis of reason, and we expel the vision of faith from academic life, we will get always a stunted conception of these questions, human nature, the world, and our relationship. So the first target, if you will, was the Western academic world, which he feels has, in many ways, marginalized the vision of faith as unreasonable or irrational, if you will. So he was countering that argument head on. He then turned the coin over and said, on the other hand, if in the world of religion we expel the critique of reason, then we border on fanaticism. Now that obviously moved in the other direction. So he was trying to handle both sides of this argument in one speech. And I think he would have pulled it off if he didn't have his friend in the audience that he felt he had to quote from his book. It would have been better to buy another copy of the book and not quote from it. But in any case, there was this second speech. However, Benedict's relationship with Islam after that was very, very rocky. But two things came out of it. 128 Muslim intellectuals wrote him a letter, wrote him a letter personally, uh, and said, we really want to understand what you meant. We really want to understand what you were trying to say. For this is an immensely important issue of what the head of the Roman Catholic Church thinks about us and our relationship. And in a, just an anecdotal footnote, nothing more than that, uh, I co-chair the academic council of a center at Georgetown called the Center for Christian Muslim Relations. And we have Muslims from all over the world. And we had a board meeting coming up like two weeks after Regensburg that I was not approaching calmly. Uh, I just wondered what was going to happen. And there was no fireworks at the board meeting. 
but one of the Muslim scholars said to me ahead of time, he said, what we really want to understand is was this one speech, one passage of a speech that was a mistake, or is this a shift from where John Paul II had tried to cultivate relationships with us? Because he said to me, our relationship, Islam, our relationship to you as Catholics is different than to any other religious community. They treat Catholicism as a conservative community that has found a way of dealing with the world. And so you don't have to run away from the world to preserve your faith. And at the same time, you have to learn to deal with the world in terms of modernity. And so he said, that's what we really want to know, what the, what the outcome of this is. So it's interesting that this project, which is now called the Common Word Project, arose in part out of this letter of the Muslim intellectuals to Benedict. The third step in his approach to Islam, I think then, was the visit to Istanbul. The whole significance of the trip after this earlier conflict, his visit to the mosque, his respect for Islam, all of that I think has not eliminated all problems but it has uh, set the relationship on solid ground. So he, he dealt with that question, Islam, as well as the UN speech, uh, in ways that were much more forthcoming uh, than some people thought perhaps was going to be his style. And then if you turn to the democracies, again, Roman Catholicism's relationship to democracy has not been the smoothest road in the world. Uh, from 1789 and 1776 to 1965, when we had the Declaration on Religious Liberty at Vatican II, it was not a conversation that was simple by any means. So relatively recently have we established this ground and developed it, uh, his abiding concern, I think, for the role of Europe in religious terms also extends over to seeing Europe, the United States, uh, the United Kingdom as examples of church-state relationships, religion and politics relationships, which are enormously valuable if we can demonstrate Catholicism's positive relationship to democracy. He, however, worries in those settings, again, about the marginalization of religion in highly complicated, secular, democratic societies, a point to which I'll return. So, to summarize this first part of the talk, if you talk about Benedict and the world, whatever doubts there were about his willingness to engage the world, and to some degree his capacity to do so, I think there has, he has gone a long way to address that. There have been, I think, just to be honest about the thing, there have been a number of public relations fall throughs in which these were not handled well, but they are less substantive than they are tactical. He needed better help on public relations on a series of questions. Let me move from his general approach to the world to the question of how to approach his contribution to the Catholic social tradition, particularly as we find it in his most recent encyclical. And the way I will do that is to spend a little time now in the second part of the talk on what the Catholic social tradition is, that is to say, what he inherits, what is available to him, and where does he go with it. Uh, the Catholic social tradition is based on a theme that is a fundamental theme for Benedict uh, as a theologian, and that is the compatibility, the complementarity of revelation and reason. And again, in a Dominican setting, this is like preaching to the choir to spend much time on this theme, but it is fundamental. He talks, he has his own way of talking about this. He says, that there's always a need for human reason to be purified by religious insight. But then he turns it around and says there is an equal need for religion to be purified by rational, critical insight. And so while Thomas 
talked about the complementarity of re revelation and reason in an age in which those things were almost taken uh, by assumption or assumed, and he carried that synthesis to a whole new level of clarity and depth. Benedict has to make this point in an age in which the complementarity is not necessarily assumed. Uh, one doesn't have to be uh, an anti-cleric or an anti-Catholic um, or an anti-religious uh, figure in a modern American university to simply assume that it's all reason and again, no room for revelation. Uh, there are, among our brethren in the citizenship of the United States, other communities and individuals that seem to think that if you are to be religious, you must be unreasonable. And so on both sides of the, point of the fence, Benedict is trying to walk a path uh, that is of uh, some significance. And that combination of the complementarity of revelation and reason uh, is at the heart of the development of Catholic social teaching. Let me simply il illustrate the way in which those two sources of wisdom, because that is the Catholic conviction, that there are two sources of moral wisdom, the direct revelation of God, which we must interpret but is expounded in the scriptures, and then the capacity of human reason to come to fundamental moral truths and to share fundamental moral truths with others who do not share our faith or our culture. So in, the, in, in terms of the uses of revelation uh, in the building of Catholic social teaching, let me use three snapshots. There is first the book of Genesis. There is second the voice of the prophets. And there is thirdly the teaching of the New Testament. Now the Genesis creation account, uh, one of the more contested parts of scripture, the creation account, is precisely the place to go to see how powerful biblical images, in a sense, set a foundation for Catholic social teaching. Now of course, as with all things with the scriptures, uh, one doesn't simply read them off the page, one needs to interpret them. And it seems to me there are two bad ways to interpret the opening chapters of Genesis and one good way. Uh, the first bad way is to take it literally, which again drives you to seem that if you are religious you must be unreasonable, for if you try to take it literally you find yourself in a cul-de-sac. On the other hand, an equally bad way to interpret Genesis is to say that if you can't take it literally, you ought not to take it seriously. That is precisely equally wrong. These texts are not to be taken literally, but they are to be taken seriously. I always think the easiest way to get at this very colorful opening section of the scriptures is to simply understand that it was not written by a historian and it was not written by a scientist. Uh, the author of these texts had interest in neither history nor science. I think he's more appropriately understood as a poet. A poet writing Genesis 111 fits. That is to say, this is a person with a profound sense of faith. He looks at the wonder of the universe around him and says, whence did it come? And then the poet of Genesis begins to construct his answer. The first thing he wants us to know is this is God's world. So he has God sort of sit over it and around it, and God shapes the world with his hands, so-called, the way a child would shape a ball of clay. And God starts with nothing and builds the universe step by step the way you'd write a symphony, moving toward the great crescendo. And the great crescendo is when God says, like unto me, I will make them, man and woman, like unto me. From that text, from that text, Catholic social teaching finds its grounding principle. Every human being is the image of God, of whatever color, culture, ethnicity, race, religion, every human being is the image of God, the founding truth of Genesis. The second great truth of Genesis 
is when God entrusts the world to men and women. Again, in the language of the poet, he invites the men and women, invites the, the images of God to name the animals. And in the scriptures, when you name the animals, when you name anything, you are responsible for it. And so it is that the second great truth, beside the sacredness of the human person, is the notion of stewardship. We are responsible for God's earth. And so in every age, we have to ask ourselves, how are we doing with God's creation? How, and you see the two things go together. The test case for stewardship is how the sacredness of the human person is being honored or not honored. Centuries later, another snapshot, the voice of the prophets. The prophets lived eight centuries before the coming of Jesus, and while each of them had his own theology, there was a common theme that ran through the prophets. They would come into the land of Israel and enter into the society as the spokesman for God, and the prophets always had a basic mantra. The quality of your faith depends upon the character of justice in the land. How you stand with God greatly depends on how you stand with each other. And then the prophets would say, we will teach you how to ask the question about the character of justice in the land. In every age, you should ask how the widows, the orphans, and the immigrants fare the resident aliens. Now, the Congressional Budget Office in 2011 will tell us the two most vulnerable groups of people in American society are women and children. And if you are an immigrant these days, it does not feel secure. The prophets sound very contemporary. So, again, the language of eight centuries before the coming of Jesus is embodied in this social teaching. The New Testament, of course, we have the great gospel from, from Monday, the great gospel, sometimes called the judgment of the world, uh, where Jesus stands and separates the sheep from the goats, depending on whether we have fed the hungry, clothed the naked, housed the homeless. So those are all images which have to be taken and woven together in teaching. But that's where the biblical background begins, one source of the moral wisdom. The second source of the moral wisdom that goes into the social teaching, indeed, is the dominant style of teaching, is the moral wisdom of reason. Now, why is reason given such priority in the social teaching? I think for two reasons, complexity of the world and the pluralism of the world. The complexity of the world means that while biblical images inspire the soul and the imagination, they may not penetrate the economics class, or the class in world politics, or the class in international law. It is one thing to say, let justice roll down from the hills like water. It's another thing to say, do you want a five-year plan? Do you want a balanced budget or not a balanced budget, and how would you justify any of those choices morally? So there is a way in, in which uh, complexity requires that these striking images of the scriptures are translated into a kind of empirical discourse, philosophical discourse, that says we really do know how to think about justice in complicated, specific cases, not just in broad, uplifting themes. Then there is pluralism. If you're writing a social teaching, how religion is to relate to the world, then you certainly want to write in such a way that those who do not share our faith may find wisdom in our moral thought. Because without collaboration, how is it possible to get any agreement on the broad issues, politics, economics, war and peace? If we can only talk to ourselves, we are not enough, even with a billion of us, to shape the world as it needs to be shaped. So the voice of reason 
the moral voice of reason, is fundamental to Catholic thought. It is, in technical terms, an ancient philosophical tradition called natural law. And again, at a place like this, we don't need to spend much time on it. But it is simple to state the basic conception. The basic conception is that we share a common humanity. Again, think of Genesis. In my image and likeness, I will make them all. We share a common humanity. The specifying characteristic of that common humanity, what sets us apart from the rest of the created order, is our capacity for rational reflection and self-determination, intelligence and freedom. And so the premise of the ethic of reason is that those who share a common humanity and a capacity for rational reflection have the capacity to develop fundamental moral insights. Maybe not detailed moral insights, but fundamental moral insights. John Courtney Murray, the famous American Jesuit, once said the purpose of the natural law is not to create the communion of saints. It is to create a civil society, and that's quite enough of an accomplishment if we can do that. So the social teaching is a combination of these biblical insights and the articulated argument uh, of uh, the ethic of reason. Now, how has this teaching evolved prior to Benedict? Really, we're in the fourth stage of the development of modern social teaching. Uh, the uh, chronological framework runs from about 1890 until today. The first phase of development was a response to the moral consequences of the Industrial Revolution. So that first phase runs from about 1890 to 1930. The second phase uh, is the emergence uh, after World War II of a truly global international system. And so the second phase is the internationalization of Catholic social teaching. The third phase is the rise of what social scientists here, like Daniel Bell, call post-industrial society. And then the fourth phase is the phase of John Paul II and Benedict XVI. Now this evolution, in a sense, I've purposely described it in non-religious, non-moral terms, because the social teaching, on the whole, is a response to problems that already exist. This is not theorizing uh, before things happen. It is the church trying to deal with problems that affect its own congregation and the world in which they live. The Industrial Revolution, of course, had huge moral consequences as the movement from an agricultural to an industrial society created all of the working conditions that we all know from high school about in the industrial age. But those working conditions were moral problems. And so the early social teaching was about things like the responsibility of the state to protect workers. Secondly, the right of workers to unionize. Thirdly, the question of fair wages and working conditions. These were the kinds of themes that developed in the first 40 years of the teaching. Fundamental to them was a counterpoint to the so-called Manche Manchester School of Economic Liberalism that said that the state had no positive moral responsibility. Its only responsibility was to keep the playing field within some kind of order, and then the competition en ensued, and the devil took the hindmost. This was the counter-argument to that. The internationalization meant that the problems after World War II moved beyond the nation state. And we developed what you really could call, the, for the first time, a truly global international order. There were 40, 45 countries at the founding of the United Nations. There is 194 today. We are only 60 years removed from that. And so you've gone from a world that was basically Europe in its diplomatic significance to a world that is truly global. So therefore, the questions that arise 
in that court, in that setting, as that dynamic moves, the questions that arise politically, economically, in terms of war and peace, in terms of the, nu the nuclear age, were the questions that had to be addressed in the social teaching. The rise of post-industrial society are those societies that first went through the Industrial Revolution. And by the 1960s, when Daniel Bell started to write about this notion of post-industrial society, the argument was these nations have now gone through an equally profound set of changes. They are highly complicated societies, market economies, democracies, filled with science and technology, oriented toward not manufacturing but the knowledge industry, and all of those questions. Then John the 23rd said there were questions of quality more so than quantity, whereas questions in the past had been questions of quantity. So those were the first three stages of the, of the social teaching. And then you come to the fourth stage, which will be my final section of the talk. But before I get there, let me step back from this historical evolution and simply say, what are the basic ideas that run through this tradition, uh, this tradition of revelation and reason? And if you wanted to synthesize what this uh, conception of the social teaching was about, you want to reduce it to bare core ideas. It's a three-step process. It starts with the dignity of the human person. Genesis calls it the sacredness of the human person. But sacredness implies religious themes. And therefore, if we're trying to speak in terms that others might find wisdom when they don't find knowledge in our faith, we talk about the dignity of the human person. You don't lose a lot, you lose a little. Sacredness surrounds the person with a sense of awe and wonder. But dignity is the notion that the person deserves a certain kind of treatment just because they're a human being. That is the idea that stands behind then the second part of Catholic social teaching, which is its dependence on a doctrine of human rights. There's a long story here, too, which you'll be glad to know you won't get. But there is a long story about Catholic acceptance of human rights. Human rights language tended to be the product of modern moral philosophy. It is the product of Rousseau and Hobbes and Locke. These are not famous names in the Catholic pantheon. So there was a, 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 a kind of distancing uh, between the natural law tradition and the so-called natural rights tradition. John the 23rd sort of just wove the two of them together in his encyclical Peace on Earth in 1963. That gave heartburn to some political philosophers, but popes don't worry about heartburn. So there was just a, a movement that just said, this is language we need to use, and it is language we have been using. The idea of human rights is directly connected to the idea of the dignity of the person. A right is a moral claim to a good that is essential for human dignity. At least that's my view of it. A right is a moral claim. It's a claim on the conscience of others. A right is a moral claim to a good that is essential for human dignity. So we have to be careful with rights language. We don't want to confuse rights with felt needs. I may have a felt need for a Mercedes Benz, but I don't have a moral right to a Mercedes Benz. But when someone says they have the right to health care, the right to a decent wage for their work, that is a moral claim, and it's a moral claim made against the conscience of others. On the other hand, Catholic thought again is different than the modern moral philosophy on rights in the sense that it is more prone to connect rights and duties. That is to say there's a correlation here. If you have a right, I have a duty. And even a second correlation is usually in Catholic thought we come to decide what are appropriate rights by what the duties are that we have and what rights we need to fulfill those duties. So if we say a working man has a right or a working person has a right to a decent wage, you start with the duty 
that person has to support themselves and their family, and then you ask what rights do they need to claim in order to do that. There's a whole argument about that that I will skip right over. But that's the first two steps, the dignity of the person and the rights that surround the person. The third step is very Thomistic. The third step is the social nature of the person. Again, the modern moral philosophers, Locke and others, uh, have a thin social fabric uh, among us. The stress is on the individual, the individual standing over against the state. The Catholic notion is that we are social by nature, not by choice. That is to say that in order to become a fully human person, we need multiple communities that nurture our humanity and help it to develop. So we talk about, with Aquinas, we talk about three communities that are part of us by nature, not by choice. Think of the language of the social contract. That's by choice. This is a different dynamic. So we talk about the family, the civil society, call it the nation, and the human community. And so this ethic talks about the fact that we are related to those three communities, each of us in some way. And all of Catholic social teaching, in some way or other, is an attempt to ask how should we structure the three great communities in order that every person who has human dignity, who reflects the image of God, will have the appropriate support system that makes up the uh, uh, well-ordered society. So that's the background that faces Benedict when he comes to the papacy. Now, let me come to the final section here where I am back again with John Paul and Benedict. Because there's no way Benedict would want to and no way that he could escape what I've called the shadow of John Paul II, precisely because John Paul II was so powerfully influential in shaping Catholic social thought uh, in the last half of the 20th century. But with John Paul II, it was never only the teaching. Uh, it was, uh, you always had to watch his words and his deeds because together they filled out the picture. You will remember that he was absolutely opposed to priests in politics, absolutely opposed to it. Most people who watched him did not think he was an unpolitical pope. So it was a matter of words and deeds if you want to get the whole picture. Uh, so uh, the, the, uh, the, the way to talk about this is to say again a little bit about John Paul II and then look at where Benedict fits. John Paul II uh, brought to the social teaching a mix of intellectual background and profound experiential uh, life as a priest and bishop. He was not, like Benedict is, a theologian. He was a moral philosopher. He worked in the realm of reason, although he wrote a lot of theology as pope. But unlike Benedict, he was not by training and teaching and publication a, uh, a theologian, he was a philosopher. Uh, secondly, when you ask what is the social teaching of John Paul II, here is where you come to a fundamental point, I think. I think it is virtually impossible to separate out the social from any of his work, or to put it another way, the social dimension of reality and the social dimension understood as a set of moral themes are so woven together that no matter what he writes on, the social theme is always there. There are three encyclicals that were listed as his social encyclicals. Uh, the first was on the dignity of work, laborum exertions. The second on uh, the, the theme that Benedict writes on, uh, human development and economics in the world, and that was the uh, uh, socialis rei, uh, solicitudo rei socialis, uh, concern for the social good. And then thirdly, the anniversary encyclical of the first hundred years of Catholic social teaching. Those were his three. But he wove the social through 
everything. And therefore, he had an impact on the social teaching that was immediately uh, present to Benedict as Benedict went to write. John Paul II's impact cut across the following areas. First of all, the way he used revelation and reason. The social teaching up until, uh, really up until uh, Paul VI, uh, was almost entirely the, the language of reason. There was very little biblical imagery, biblical thought in the social teaching. Paul VI brought some in. John Paul II brought a great deal in. So he brought into the balance of the social teaching a more relig explicitly religious theme without losing the language of human rights, which might have been described as the signature uh, theme of his papacy. Secondly, uh, he talked about work in a particular way that is, I think, particularly valuable to us in light of the financial crisis. Uh, this was a man who knew about work in different ways. He had worked in a chemical factory. He was an actor. He was a poet. He was a playwright. He was a priest. He was a professor. He was a bishop. And he was a pope. Not a bad resume. <laughs> so when he talked about work, intellectually, the work that one did with one's hands, the work one did with one's mind, when he talked about that, it came out of a very, very uh, interesting background. And what he said about work was, he said, work is the answer to the social question. That is to say, the capacity to work and to earn one's living in a way that guarantees basic human dignity is the key to the social question. He also talked about unemployment as more than an economic reality. His point was we were made to work. We didn't work just out of necessity, but God made us to work. He called us co-creators with God. And therefore, he said, when someone can't work, then their very dignity the call to which they have been shaped by God is to some degree stunted and cut off. And if you look at our own land with eight, nine percent unemployment or more in certain areas of this state, and one thinks about it in more than just the labor statistics, uh, when you're in a parish, you can see it. When you're in a parish, uh, I remember the first parish I was in was all filled with engineers. They had never been without a job. They came out of MIT and the jobs were everywhere. And we hit at that what, in comparison to what we have today, would have just been a blip on the screen of unemployment. And the talk was of people, of men who dressed up in a three-piece suit every morning at seven o'clock, took their briefcase, went to the car, and went off to some neighboring town and spent the day in a library so no one would know they were out of work because it was just a devastating kind of thing. And that kind of insight is the way he talked about work. The international dimension, his two UN addresses, his role in the Cold War, his stress on the question of the world's responsibility for what we today call the global south, if you will, uh, was part and parcel of his, his, his contribution. So, with all of that as the background, Benedict steps onto the stage. Is there continuity with John Paul II? Yeah. Is there discontinuity? Yes, there's some, and it's created some controversy. Uh, some argue that Benedict's very strong sense of human relationships means that he focuses the social teaching more on interpersonal themes and not sufficiently on what you might call social structural themes, the sort of hard edge of economics and politics. And so there is some sense that this is, this is less, uh, less uh, dramatic critique uh, than is necessary in the social teaching. Um, but uh, I think that that statement, while there are themes that would move you in that direction, I'm not positive that I'm as taken by the discontinuity theme as some are. 
there is, uh, in his first three encyclicals, all three of them are filled with this social sense of things. His encyclical, first three encyclicals were not on the Trinity, the divinity of Jesus, or the ecclesiology of the church. His first encyclical was called God is Love. The second was we are saved by faith. And the third was the one is charity in truth. All three of them uh, are filled with social themes. God is love is the question about how uh, God's love enters the human community and is manifested in two very different ways. First, in the relationship of men and women and marital love and the way in which they imitate the love of God in their own love. But the second is how the church is called to organize charity in a world in which poverty is all too evident. The second one, Saved by Hope, is perhaps the least social, but it is not without its social themes. And the third, Charity and Truth, written after the financial crisis, is of course the one that most directly addresses our theme tonight. Now the first thing to note, God is love, charity, charity in truth. The first thing to note is that this is a voice of charity in a tradition of justice. That is to say, if you look at the social teaching that I've traced, the dominant category is social justice. The social teaching of the church becomes a social justice tradition. Benedict hits the theme, and he talks not about justice primarily, but about charity. So what difference does this make? Well, in the traditional teaching uh, of the 20th century, the use of justice is rooted in Aristotle, drawn through Aquinas, and then applied today. And the character of justice language is that it tells us what our duties are to others what our obligations are, whether we think about interpersonal relationships, paying our bill, or whether we think about social relationships, the debt of third world nations. Two kinds of debts, but both of them can be cast in the language of justice. The language of justice focuses on what the prophets used to focus on, what social scientists call structural relationships. What are the wages paid? What is the pattern of equality or inequality? How do we think about taxes and fiscal policy? These are the structural questions, not interpersonal questions. And so that's been the dominant tradition. Into that tradition, Benedict speaks the language of charity. Now, it was too simple to say that he was throwing away justice, and it was too simple to say the charity did not have any structural significance. Because in charity, uh, in Catholic theology, charity has two different meanings. There is a broad meaning, and then there's a specific meaning. Now again, this is Aquinas, and uh, in a remarkable ecumenical exercise, there once was a Jesuit who wrote a book on Aquinas' view on charity. His name was Gerard Gilman. And uh, Gielman said, basically, in uh, what Thomas tells us is he describes charity as the root, the mother, and the form of all the virtues. That is to say, charity is the foundation from which all our virtues uh, arise. So charity is, if you will, the love of God within us. And then we manifest that love in different other virtues. We're compassionate, we're just, we're truthful, and we're charitable. The specific, narrow meaning of charity is that you share your surplus goods with the needy. Now this is where people were nervous. They thought Benedict was working only with that idea, which loses the whole sense of looking at broad structural questions like international trade, tax, and fiscal policy. But if you look at the broad meaning of charity, then I think there is room to say that justice is grounded in charity and the two together can be used to analyze, uh, if you will, the dominant questions of the day. So, what does Benedict add in this last encyclical, my final set of thoughts? First of all, the, the overarching theme 
is the theme of globalization, this fact of life today. I talked about the end of World War II as providing a, uh, a, a truly international global system. But that was in broad terms. That meant that you had the creation of new states and their relationships in the UN. Globalization is different than that. Globalization is the increasing uh, integration of the way we touch each other's lives across national boundaries. Thomas Friedman from the New York Times calls it integration further, faster, farther. So the idea is we're still, we still live in states, but because particularly of the political economy bonds that are created across state lines, combined with new technology, new communication, and what you might call the CNN effect, so that the Japanese crisis is in our living room. The Libyan horror story is in our living room. That has an effect psychologically that corresponds to the political economic bonds by which we are tied together and which we experienced with devastating clarity in the financial crisis. That when it goes wrong in one place, it goes wrong across the globe, not just in some places. So globalization is the background. It is a fact of life. Now, globalization is a contested term. Many people say the less of it we had, the better off many people would be. Other people, like Friedman, think it's the answer to everything. Benedict doesn't fall in either camp. He thinks that globalization is a human creation and it requires human direction. It is not a fact of nature that should dictate to us how we live our lives. Uh, the way I would put it is globalization has its own logic. It does not have its own ethic. So the logic of globalization is integration further, faster, farther. But the ethic of globalization is where to contain it, where to direct it, and how to compensate when it rewards some much greater than others. This is behind everything Benedict talks about. So next step, global governance. This is one of his themes and perhaps the one that attracted the most critique. His argument is in light of the financial crisis of 207, 208, and 209, uh, or 207, 208, uh, 209, and then he writes the letter. And his argument is that the financial crisis illustrates that there needs to be a better architecture globally, not to suppress human initiative and ingenuity, but not to let it run wild either. Not a new theme in the social teaching. The Catholic teaching has argued since the 60s that as we moved from interdependence to globalization, which in fact deepens the way we impact each other, that there is need of some framework around states and over states and other actors that looks over the dominant fact of globalization and what its outcomes are as well as its methods. So that is a first concern. A second concern of his is the question of, that we use in the American debate and is the role of the state. That is to say, what is the moral role of government and the role of the state? And he argues that you have to fit the role of government between two things, subsidiarity on the one hand and solidarity on the other. Subsidiarity means you don't give all power to the state domestically, nor would you give it all power to a single institution in a financial architecture. That the idea is you pay attention to local and intermediary themes. But the other side of that is solidarity, that the state does have a moral responsibility, and it is particularly the case of a moral responsibility to the poor. Now, in the situation we're in, having come up, come, gone through the financial crisis, we seem to be, at least people I read who know the economics better than I do, is we've got recovery, but we've got recovery with very disparate results. So when one is talking about eight, nine percent unemployment, 
when one is talking about 14 to 15 percent of the American public qualifying as poor, meaning a family of four that makes less than $23,000 a year for a family of four. When we've got that situation, the notion that the state's role is to be the umpire and not to be directly engaged fails the test of Catholic social teaching. So global governance on the one hand, a role for the state which is limited but activist on the other. Think of our public debate today about the state because this is going to get you to taxes and fiscal policy and what is just in terms of the country as a whole. Finally, for Benedict, there is the public role of the church. He argues that there are two forces that uh, need to be uh, resisted, a complete secularization and secondly, fundamentalism. Secularization rooted in a view that religion should have no public voice. It's fine for people to be religious, but religion should have not a public voice. Public voices should be secular. He resists that. Fundamentalism, he also resists the notion that religion should make claims that it cannot rationally justify. So he resists those two, and between, he sees a public role for the church as a teacher and a voice of advocacy, and finally, a voice, an institution that produces social institutions. This was his theme in his first encyclical, that it, the, we produce social institutions, education, health care, and social service. We do that out of the church, but we do it for the good of the whole society. And so he wants to both lift that up, he also wants to resist um, uh, uh, moves in society that seek to threaten the existence of these institutions, and he wants to promise that these institutions will help in the process uh, of building a just society. He is in continuity with his past. He is different than his past. He lives within the shadow of John Paul II, but he has given us plenty to think about. Thank you very much.